Uh, thank you very much, Gretchen. Um, Gretchen has been incredible. Her leadership, both tonight and for over the last 17 months, has been incredible. Thank you very much, Gretchen. It's, it's great honor to be introduced by you. And I want to thank Vital Voices, Elise, and colleagues. This is a great honor for me and a great opportunity for me as well. So thank you very much. Obviously, it's, it's all, for all of us honorees, I think it's a special night. So thank you for that. I also want to thank my wife, Dr. Shelley Erickson, who's been my rock and my redeemer for all these many years. Putting up with the, uh, being the spouse of an activist like me is not an easy thing. So I, I do appreciate it very much, Shelley. And my son Judah, my son Judah, who for his 16 years has also been part of my support network and, um, and love. Thank you, Judah, as well. You know, women's leadership has made possible a new conversation among men. Let's be clear, the moment that we're living in where so many women have come forward, but also so many women across race, class, ethnicity, geography, um, all over the world, women have been incredible in what they've been able to accomplish over the past half a century. There have been male allies, but women's leadership and women's advocacy has really changed the world and continues to do so. Um, but it hasn't just benefited women and girls. One of the misconceptions about women's leadership is that somehow women and girls have benefited, but men and boys maybe not so much. That's a misconception. Men and boys' lives have been profoundly affected in a very positive way by women's leadership and advocacy on these matters. And I Thank you. And by the way, David's references to TED Talk, and by the way, you did a fantastic job. Uh, uh, I'm looking at this as like a mini TED Talk, which is, TED Talks are challenging, but this is even more challenging because there's so much to say and not a whole lot of uh, time to, to say it in. But just a couple examples of the leadership of women, how that has benefited men and boys. Um, let's talk about domestic violence and its effects on children, right? In the field, we've been talking about this for about 20 years, about the, all the children growing up in homes where their father abuses their mother, their mother's boyfriend abuses their mother, sometimes the mother's abusive. This is true in gay male and lesbian relationships. There's an awful lot of kids growing up in homes where they're being traumatized by, quote, domestic violence. Well, the category of children who are in this being thusly traumatized includes not just girls, but also boys. Do you have any idea how many boys are in the juvenile system as we speak in the state of New York who are in the system in part because their life journey started out as traumatized boys in domestic violence families where their father was terrorizing them, their mothers, their siblings? Do you have any idea how many adult men are in prisons throughout the United States in every state who were traumatized little boys at one point, many of them armored up early on in their lives because of the effects of, of violence? And they, they took some of them, the path that so, so, so often we give men and boys who are the victims of violence, which is somebody took something from me, I'm going to take it from somebody else, and I'm going to... So much of the bad behavior by men and boys in the world has some of its roots in violence done to boys and young men in childhood and adolescence, and a lot of that violence starts at home. And feminist theorists and activists have been saying for decades that we have to make connections between what happens in the family and what happens on the street. The private sphere and the public sphere are intimately linked and intricately interwoven, so we can't pretend any longer, if we could ever pretend, that somehow we can talk about gang violence and street violence and terrorism and violence out of all kinds and not talk about violence in the family where so much of it starts. And <laughs> another benefit to men and boys of this moment, if you will, and over the last number of years, is how we're now talking about male sexual victimization, all the men and young men and boys who have been victims of sexual violence, most of the time at the hands of other men and boys, sometimes by women, but mostly by other men and boys. And why, why do you think we're having this conversation today? In other words, why do you think there's cultural space to talk about men as the victims and survivors of sexual violence? You know why? It's because women's leadership made it possible. And the women in the rape crisis movement and the domestic violence movement in the 70s created the paradigm of moving, changing the narrative of your life from being a victim who's gonna be silenced to taking, reclaiming the narrative and being a survivor. That's a, that's a courageous path. Not everybody who's been a victim or, or is ready to be a survivor in that sense. But when they do, that's an act of courage. But the, the men who do that, are walking a path that has already been blazed, a trail that are, has already been blazed by the women who came before them. But when's the last time you heard cultural acceptance and space for talking about men as victims of sexual violence attributed to the leadership of women in the battered women's and sexual assault movements? You're much more likely to hear women in those movements 
called anti-male and bashing men and they have an agenda against men and similar kinds of nonsense. So if one thing that we can do in this cultural moment with more men's leadership in this room and elsewhere is to start standing with women in the, in the field, taking some of the incoming, some of the criticism, some of the negative stuff that they have to deal with, whether it's in Pakistan or in New York City, and stand with them, and so we can take some of that off of their shoulders. It should never have been on their shoulders in the first place, and certainly never should be in the future. Now, one of the things we have to think about, if you will, is to, we have to think differently about these issues. And I, in my, much of my work, and Gretchen referenced some of this, have been about trying to help people think outside the box, right? In other words, we need a paradigm shift in our thinking, a new conceptual framework to apply to these issues. And I beg your indulgence, I'm just gonna give you a really, really like a, a, a lightning round lecture on this, but language is so important. And those of us in this room, many of us have influence in the way that we talk and people hear us speak. So I just wanna give you a handful of examples of the kind of language that we could be using if we wanted to go the next step. Part of it is, is calling, women, calling domestic and sexual violence a women's issue, when in fact men are committing the vast majority of the violence, which is, I think, a subtle form of victim blaming to call these issues women's issues. It shifts accountability off of the dominant group and onto the group with less power. That's, by definition, part of the problem. I'll give you a handful of examples of what I'm talking about. You'll hear people say things like, how many women were raped last year, rather than how many men raped women. You'll hear people say things like, how many girls in the, you know, the New York Unified School District were sexually harassed last year, rather than how many boys sexually harassed girls. You'll hear people say things like, how many teenage girls in the state of New York got pregnant last year, rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. Even, even the term violence against women is problematic. I'm, I'm sorry. I never use it without problematizing it. What's missing from the term? The active agent. In linguistic terms, violence against women is a passive phrase. There's no active agent. It's happening to women, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just kind of experiencing it, like the weather. But if you insert the active agent, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate. It's more honest, isn't it? And do I think it's unfair to men to be accurate and honest? No, I don't think so. I think it's, I, I, as a man, when I hear women angry and calling out men's violence, I don't get defensive like somehow I'm being bashed because I'm a man. I think I'm a man and I'm in a position to do something about it. Let's figure out what we can do about it because it's totally intolerable for both women and men, girls and boys, and especially the men in this room. A lot of us have social power, political power, economic capital, social capital. We have incredible opportunity in front of us, don't you think? Now, the last point is in addition to shifting the paradigm to seeing these issues as men's issues, not just women's issues that good men help out with, um, I, I have to say this, these are also leadership issues for men. This is really about leadership. And how do you define leadership? You can define it at all different levels. It can be um, formal or informal. It can be in a small group of friends that you're hanging out with, or it can be, you know, the most powerful people in a, in a business or in a political sense or, or in any other sense. Um, if you're a man, however, and you're in a position of leadership, you need to know about sexual assault and domestic violence and sexual harassment and how they're interlocked and interlinked with a whole range of other social problems, because they are, by the way. These aren't siloed issues. They're related to everything else, whether it's you know, gang violence and mass shootings, or, you know, alcohol and drug problems. Um, HIV, all these issues are interlinked with domestic and sexual violence, and those of us in the work know this. We need to share this more broadly with people outside the work because that's part of our, you know, part of our challenge. But if you're a man and you're in a position of leadership, you need to know all this. And then you need to figure out how you can support victims and survivors, how you can hold offenders accountable, and how you can create a climate whereby this abusive behavior doesn't even happen in the first place. Not because you're a nice man helping out the women, that's the old paradigm, but because you're a leader and we expect that of our leaders. If we could get to the place in our society where uh, men in positions of leadership would know that this is part of their expectation, but young men growing up who are aspiring to positions of leadership knew that this was expected of them to get the tools so that they could be leaders in this way, the change that we need to have will happen much more quickly. So I hope going forward in the next generation that our generation can leave behind some tools so that the younger men and women can work together and solve some of the problems that our generation hasn't been very good at solving quite yet. Because with men and women working together, we can really, really change the world. Thank you very much.